Okay, so are you uh, okay? Are you ready first? Uh, I forgot to ask. Yes. Yeah, you're ready. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it's great pleasure to have uh, Kalista Bernard uh, from Stanford University. Uh, she is going to tell us about uh, twisted homology operations. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, so this this talk is about homology operations, and the purpose of these is to study EN algebras. So I wanted to just spend a couple of minutes giving a brief overview of EN algebras in case people don't know what those are. And for those of you who went to my talk in the grad student seminar last week, uh, this will be a slightly more general setting than what I was talking about there. So I'll define EN algebras in terms of certain spaces, which I'll call DNK. So this is a space of what I call standard embeddings. I'll say what that is in a second, of a disjoint union of K copies of an N disk into an N disk. So here dn is the unit disk in Rn. And by this notation, I mean I only allow the embeddings that are translations and scalings. So coordinate wise, translations and scalings, and I don't allow rotations or anything like that. So an example of a point in one of these spaces would be something like this. So this is a an embedding of three disks in R2, so that's D2, three. And these spaces then come with a bit of extra data. So I equip DNK with an action of the, K, the symmetric group on K letters, sigma K, that's just defined by permuting the labels of these disks. And now I, so I'll use these spaces to define EN algebras and I wanna be able to work in a general category, although classically these were defined in spaces. Um, but for me, I'll let C be a symmetric monoidal category. Uh, so monoidal means I have a notion of product in this category and I'll denote this product with a tensor symbol. And I want to require I have a little bit of extra data, namely a functor, call it cross, that goes from the category of spaces cross C into C. So I have some sort of notion of how to take a product of a space with an object of C. And of course, there should be some additional technical assumptions on this functor in this category that are not so important for the scope of this talk. Um, okay, so maybe the two good examples of such a C to keep in mind are, first of all, C can be the category of spaces itself, where this functor from top cross top to top is just the usual product of spaces. So I have a space X and a space Y, and I send them to the Cartesian product X cross Y. Um, another important example, which is perhaps more related to this talk, is the category of chain complexes. Where here, this functor going from top cross chain complexes to chain complexes, sends a space K and a chain complex X to the singular chains on the space K tensored with X. And this is the usual tensor product of chain complexes. So this one's maybe sort of closer to the context we'll be working in today. And now I can say what an EN algebra is in this category. So an EN algebra in this category C consists of the data of some object X and C together with a bunch of maps going from say DNK cross the K fold power of X with itself and landing in X. And I have one of these maps for all K and they should satisfy some additional conditions that I won't spell out in detail. Um, there's an equivariance condition 
um, an associativity condition, and a unit condition. So a couple of comments about this definition. First of all, you should think of this as saying that the space DNK parametrizes K area operations on X. Sort of for every point in this space, I get an operation on X. Um, this equivariance condition can sort of be summarized as saying that this map should factor through the quotient by the symmetric group action. So what I mean by that is here I have this action of the symmetric group on this space DNK by permuting the disks, and I have an action of the symmetric group on this k-fold tensor power by permuting the factors. That's because I have a symmetric monoidal category. And so if I permute the labels of the disks and then multiply, that should be the same thing as not permuting the labels, but permuting the factors instead and then multiplying. And the associativity says something about, I have some information about how these operations compose and they should be appropriately associative. And the unit condition says that the identity embedding of one disk into itself gives the identity map on X. But the specifics of these conditions are not so important. Um, and it turns out there are a lot of examples of EN algebras in, in various different areas of math. And we'll see a couple of examples in this talk. Um, I do want to give one important construction here that I will use a bit, namely the construction of free EN algebras. So you can think of this as a functor going from C to a category of EN algebras in C. And I'll denote this functor by EN parentheses. And this takes an object X of C and sends it to the coproduct over all K of this space D and K cross with the K fold tensor power of X. And then I mod out by the symmetric group action. Um, okay, so the details are not so important, but this is some sort of free EN algebra construction and it should be left adjoint to the forgetful functor. Um, okay, so hopefully this gives you some vague idea of what EN algebras are. Um, before we start constructing these tools for analyzing them. Are there any questions about this? Good. Okay, so I want to spend a few minutes sort of summarizing the classical case because these homology operations were classically constructed in, I don't know, the 60s or 70s already. And so it's a bit helpful to have some context for how my operations relate to the classical operations. Um, so here we want to work in the category of chain complexes over a field. So for the whole talk, F will denote a field. Um, and I'm going to consider uh, cave homology with coefficients in F as a functor going from the category of EN algebras in chain complexes to the category of sets. So it takes an EN algebra to just the kth homology of its underlying chain complex. And one comment here about sets, uh, of course this has an F vector space structure, but I actually do want to forget all the way down to sets for the purposes of these operations. Um, so what I mean by a homology operation now can be phrased in terms of these functors. So a J ary homology operation is a natural transformation of these homology functors. So a bit more explicitly, uh, the J array part refers to having J inputs. So I'll actually have something like going from the L1 homology cross all the way up to the LJ homology. So that's my J inputs and I'll land in, say, the mth homology. 
So here L1 up to Lj and M are any integers. So they, there need not be any relationship between them. Um, and so I want to look at all natural transformations like this. So of course, if I have some operations like this, this sort of gives me extra structure on the homology of EN algebras. So this is a really useful tool for studying homology of EN algebras. Um, so it would be nice if I could, for example, classify all of these operations. So in fact, by a version of the Unata lemma, such natural transformations are in bijection with classes in the nth homology of a free EN algebra that's free on a direct sum of from i equals one to j of certain chain complexes, which I'll write with square brackets. So this is this free E and algebra functor that I mentioned on the left. And the square brackets notation means that I have a chain complex that's just zero everywhere, except for a single copy of F. And that copy of F is in degree Li here. So this means that if I have an understanding of the homology of free E and algebras, then I can classify all operations. So now I can state the, the classical result. So for this, we are going to let the fields F be FP, the field with P elements. Can I ask you a no. question? Uh, two questions, actually. One is, uh, is there a particular reason you define the homology as a functor to sets rather than abelian groups or field in this case? Yeah, I mean, spaces? the main reason for that is I want to consider operations that don't necessarily factor through a tensor product, for example. So it just allows me to consider more general operations. Um, they're, they're not additive at all, these operations? Yeah, they don't have to be. No. Yeah, so some of the operations, then it's sort of part of the theorem that you have to prove that they're additive or something like that. No. The second question is the classes in this EN algebra. What do you mean by homology of EN algebra then? Is it a homology of an algebra or... Ah, yeah, so here the free EN algebra is, I mean, it's an EN algebra in chain complexes. So it's a chain complex with extra structure. So what I mean by that is just forget the extra structure and just take the homology of the chain complex. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Good. The set pointed sets. Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I don't think that's important in general. Sure. Um, good. Okay, so now where I can state the result when f is fp, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm uh, going to. It's it's a little hard to see the top part. Could you just shift oh. it a little down? Yes. Okay. Is that better? Yes. Good. Um, okay, so for this talk, I'm going to let P be an odd prime. Uh, of course, there's a perfectly reasonable theory for P equals two, but the formulas look a little bit different for P equals two. And we'll see later on that for twisted coefficients, P equals two is a little bit boring. So I'm just going to only state things for odd primes here. So this Classical story is due to Fred Cohen and Peter May, who showed that all operations on EN algebras are generated by the following list. So first of all, we have a product which is a binary operation. So it has two inputs, as you might expect. So this goes from H 
L1 tensor HL2 and lands in L1 plus L2 homology. Here, I do really mean tensor product. So this, this is defined on the Cartesian product, but then it actually is bilinear and does factor through the tensor product. Um, then I have a bunch of operations, which are usually called Dyer-Lashoff operations or Dyer-Lashoff-Kudo-Araki operations. And uh, these are unary operations, so they only take one input. And they're usually written something like QS, going from the L homology to the L plus 2S times P minus one homology. And for each of these, I also have something that I'll write as Bockstein or beta of that, which goes from L homology and lands in one degree lower. So L plus 2S times P minus one minus one. And I have one of these operations whenever 2s minus l is between 0 and n minus 1. Sorry, I ran out of space a bit there. So here, this n matches the n of en. So if I have, if I let n increase, I get more and more of these operations. And in particular, for e infinity algebras, I have infinitely many of these operations. Um, one other comment. This notation suggestively is written like this. So if you have a Bachstein homomorphism, then this operation is Bachstein of QS. But this is defined in situations where there is no Bachstein. So you should think of it as sort of it's being its own operation. Okay. And then the last operation that you get is only needed for EN when N is finite. And this is called the Browder bracket. which is again a binary operation. So this one I'll write with a bracket notation and it goes from L1 homology. Again, it actually factors through the tensor product. So L1 tensor L2 homology and lands in L1 plus L2 plus N minus one homology. Okay, so these are the particular operations that Cohen and May work with. And then they show, they, they do a computation and compute the homology of a free EN algebra, say free on X with FP coefficients in terms of the homology of X with FP coefficients using these operations. So slightly more explicitly, they start with the homology of X and then they sort of formally apply these operations and mod out by certain relations. And they show that that gives a description of the homology of the free EN algebra on X. So then because they've given a description of the homology of free things by this discussion we had on the left, that gives a classification of all operations in terms of these operations. So this is sort of a nice complete theory. And maybe the last thing I'll say is to give an example because this computation is really nice if you need to say compute the homology of a free EN algebra. So let's look at the simplest example. So as a space, this is the free E2 algebra on a point, which is the same as a disjoint union of classifying spaces of braid groups. So their result says that the homology of this free E2 algebra with FP coefficients is isomorphic to, well, a tensor product of exterior and polynomial algebras. So I'll write down what the whole thing is and then say in a bit more detail what all of these generators are. So I have an exterior algebra on classes Z to P to the I, and then a polynomial algebra on classes, sorry, that should be a Y, to P to the I plus one. Sorry, I ran out of space again. The particular indices are not so important, but let me know if you want to know them uh, and can't read them. So here, anything I labeled as a Z with index J 
lives in J minus one homology of the braid group on J strands. And anything I labeled as a Y with index J lives in J minus two homology of the braid group on J strands. And how did the operations come into it? Well, here Z2 is the Browder bracket of Z1 with itself. And if I is greater than zero, then Z2P to the I is equal to a dyer lashoff operation applied to the previous Z class. So Z2P to the I minus one. And Y2P to the I is equal to one of these box dye and dyer lashoff operations also applied to the previous Z class. So sort of the upshot is we started with this one class, Z1, which lives in the zeroth homology of the braid group on one strand. And we sort of iterated these operations on it and took products and we got the entire homology from that. So this gives this really nice calculational result um, with very little effort. Uh, so this is really nice for examples in general. Okay, are there any questions about this classical story before I move on? All right. So let's talk about my work on twisted homology. The goal of this is just to generalize what I what I just explained and to develop a theory of operations on the twisted homology of EN algebras. So for homology with certain twisted coefficient systems, I would like to come up with a complete theory like Cohen and May did. Um, so before I actually get into how to do this, I think maybe it's useful if I say something about motivation. Um, one reason to do this is these operations, especially these Dyer-Lashoff operations are sort of very fundamental objects in algebraic topology. And so having a more general version of them could be considered as foundational work in some sense. Um, and there will hopefully be a lot of interesting applications. Um, there is one particular type of example I have in mind um, or actually one specific case, which is to apply this to obtain new results in homological stability of special linear groups of a ring R. Um, okay, so why would I hope to do this? Well, um, if you consider the disjoint union of classifying spaces of general linear groups, this actually has a well-known E infinity structure. And it turns out that this E infinity structure can be leveraged to study homological stability of the general linear groups. So this was work of Søren Galatius, Alexander Coopers, and Oscar Randall Williams uh, in the case when R is a field. Um, so in their work, it's really important that you have this E infinity structure, even though asking if a sequence of groups has homological stability doesn't require having this E infinity structure. So this is sort of an extra input. Um, and another important ingredient in their work is this understanding of the homology of free E infinity algebras in terms of these operations. So this calculational result of Cohen and May is really important for their work. So you could try to do something similar for special linear groups. I can again consider a disjoint union of classifying spaces of special linear groups. Um, and you might think you could restrict the E infinity structure here to get an E infinity structure here. But unfortunately it doesn't quite work and you don't actually get something E infinity. But it's not too hard to show that the homology of special linear groups is isomorphic to 
the homology of general linear groups, but with twisted coefficients. So instead you can study this right-hand side and here you do have an E infinity structure on general linear groups. And so you can apply the methods of Galatius, Cooper's, Randall, Williams. But what you're missing is this description of the homology of free E infinity algebras with twisted coefficients. So my work sort of provides this input, this understanding of homology operations for twisted coefficients. Um, so this particular example is an upcoming joint project with Jeremy Miller and Peter Patst. Um, okay, so that's one particular example I have in mind. I think more generally, there should be other interesting interactions between this framework that Galatius Cooper's Randall Williams develop and these operations that I develop. Uh, but I also hope there will be interesting applications in other settings. Um, okay, so maybe now I'll spend some time on the setup for constructing these operations. So actually it's sort of quite difficult to come up with the right, um, the right way of discussing twisted homology operations. So we're going to spend some time on, on this setup. So I'm going to let C be a braided monoidal groupoid that has the following explicit description. So it has objects. This object set is given by the elements of A, where A is some abelian group. And the morphisms from say A1 to A2 are, well, either empty, there are no morphisms if A1 is not equal to A2. And if A1 is equal to A2, then the morphisms are given by the, obj the elements of B, where B is again an abelian group. Um, so secretly what I've done here is this is a skeletal rigid braided monoidal groupoid. Um, it just has this particularly nice description. Uh, so you can just think of it being like this and don't worry about what all of those words mean. Um, one example to keep in mind of such a category C is a skeleton of the fundamental groupoid of an n-fold loop space where here n is at least two. So this is fundamental groupoid, meaning objects are points in this space and morphisms are homotopy classes of paths between points. Um, so in this particular example, this object space, this object set A is given by pi zero of the n-fold loop space. So I get one object for every component. And these morphisms are given by pi one of the n-fold loop space, say of the uh, identity component. Just a sanity check that if n is at least two, then pi zero and pi one of an n-fold loop space are both abelian groups. So this all makes sense. Um, the fact that this fundamental groupoid is a braided monoidal groupoid comes from the fact that an n-fold loop space is an en algebra. Um, this, the en structure gives you this product and this braiding, in fact. Um, and this rigidity condition I mentioned says something about the fact that I have an actual group here instead of a monoid, uh, but that's not so important. Okay, so the actual category that I want to work in is not this category C, but rather a functor category. Um, in particular, the category of functors from C into chain complexes over F. So this functor category can be equipped with a monoidal structure, which is called the day convolution monoidal structure. 
Um, and I'll write this with a circled asterisk to distinguish it from the tensor product of chain complexes. Um, so I won't say what this is in general, but in particular, in this particular case, it has a really nice description, which you can take as the definition if you haven't seen deconvolution before. So if F and G are functors in this category, then the deconvolution of F with G evaluated on an object A is given by a direct sum over A1 plus A2 equals A of this functor F evaluated on A1, tensor the functor G evaluated on A2, and this tensor product is actually over the group ring on B. So because B was this morphism group, I have an action of B on both F of A1 and G of A2, and so it makes sense to take this tensor product. Um, and I'll just state as a fact that this deconvolution monoidal structure inherits a braiding. So this is a braided monoidal category and it's actually symmetric monoidal if the source category C is symmetric. And therefore, um, oh, I have to specify one more piece of data for you. I want to consider E and algebras in this category. So I need to define this functor I said at the beginning that allows me to take the product of one of these functors with a space. So here given a space K and a functor X, um, I obtain the functor that sends an object A to singular chains on K tensored with the functor X evaluated on A. So X evaluated on A is a chain complex and this is the ordinary tensor product of chain complexes. Um, and here a morphism on uh, an element of B acts on this X factor and doesn't do anything to this K factor. Okay, so this defines this product with spaces that I had at the beginning. And therefore it makes sense to consider EN algebras in this functor category. And so that's where I want to actually work to construct these operations. I wanna make one brief comment about this braided monoidal versus symmetric monoidal thing. Again, not so important for this talk, but at the beginning I did only define EN algebras in symmetric monoidal categories. In fact, there is a notion of E2 algebras in a braided monoidal category. There's some sort of braided E2 operad and you can define that notion in braided monoidal categories. So for the case of E2, we actually allow braided monoidal. Otherwise we will work with symmetric monoidal. Okay. And now let me define a couple of particular elements, objects in this category that are related to the coefficient systems I want to consider. So I want to let phi be a group homomorphism from this morphism group B into the units of F. And now whenever I have an object A in the source category, and whenever I have an integer K, I want to let, I want to define certain functors, F phi square brackets A K. So these live in this functor category and they're defined as follows. F phi square brackets A K evaluated on another object A prime is zero if A prime is not equal to A. And if A prime is equal to A, it's this, uh, this chain complex F square brackets K that we had earlier. So that has a copy of F in degree K and is zero everywhere else. And okay, so that's what it does on objects. A morphism B in this group B, which was again, the endomorphisms of any object in the category, um, acts on this lone copy of F in degree K by multiplication 
by phi of b. Okay, so I have these particular functors and one of them I will rename f phi. I will write that for f phi square brackets zero, zero. So this is going to be my coefficient system that I consider. So let me define what homology with coefficients in this system is, and then I'll say something about why I've chosen these coefficient systems. So given any functor x, our homology now comes with an extra grading coming from the objects of the source category. So for any a in a and any integer k, the a k homology of x with coefficients in f phi is defined as follows. So first I take x and deconvolve it with f phi, that's a functor. So I can then evaluate it on a to get a chain complex. And then I can take the ordinary k homology of this chain complex. So that's what I mean by homology. Now we can actually rewrite this a little bit more explicitly using this description of deconvolution I gave over here. So this is isomorphic to the k homology of x evaluated on A, tensor over the group ring on B with F, where here B acts on F using this morphism. So there's some non-trivial action going on here. So this maybe looks a little bit more like twisted coefficients that you're used to seeing. Uh, is this an FP or F5 on the, just a line ah, above? This one? The last one, yes. Yeah, that's a, a, a phi, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a question too, sorry. Yeah. The, the category you took, uh, you said it's a group point, but from the description, it sounds like it's a discrete category, right? That you only have morphism when things are not uh, equal. Is that, yeah, is that right? Is that, the problem? Is that what you mean by discrete? Uh, sorry? Can you apply it as a groupoid or? Ah, so this category C is still a groupoid because since B is an abelian group, all of these morphisms are invertible. And then I just yes. have no other morphisms. I, everything is discrete. Exactly. So no, no isomorphism on spherical. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I've sort of taken a skeleton of, yeah, it's a skeletal category. And when you say phi f zero zero, what you mean by zero there? You do have zero objects also? Ah, that's very good. This is maybe slightly ambiguous. Here I mean the identity element in A. Okay, thanks. The additive identity. Yeah, you're right, that's a bit confusing. Um, good, other questions about these definitions? Mm, but aren't you supposed to objects in there? A is, uh, uh, huh, so. Yeah, sorry, so this, <laughs> it's a bit confusing the sorry, A versus C. So A is the objects of the category C. Okay. Um, but A is itself an abelian group. So okay. zero I wrote for the identity of the abelian group, which also is the monoidal unit of the category C. Yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's confusing and it would, might have been better okay. to write something like that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. Good. Other questions? Maybe I'll make a quick comment about why I've chosen to work with these particular coefficient systems. So I've sort of made two important assumptions here. The first choice I've made is to work only with fields. So everything here is basically just coefficients valued in a field. Um, I think that's a very reasonable assumption to make because also in the classical case, uh, they only work with fields. Of course, you can define operations for other coefficients, for example, for integers, but often you don't get a reasonable theory, then things are kind of a mess. Uh, so I think it's really reasonable to work with fields in general. Um, another assumption that I've made here, this is maybe a little bit harder to explain on short notice, but 
this assumption that I have an abelian group for my objects instead of just a monoid. So that's this assumption that C be rigid. Um, that assumption I don't think is necessary, but it is a convenient place to start. So that's why I started here. So essentially, if you think of spaces, what I'm doing by that is assuming that instead of just having any coefficient system on my space, that my coefficient system has to factor through the group completion of the space. So that's why I have this n-fold loop space, which is sort of a, a group complete version of an EN algebra. Um, and so I don't think this assumption is necessary in general, but it has been a convenient starting point. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to consider more general coefficient systems in the future. Okay, so we can again try to define homology operations on this. And we can actually just do the exact same procedure that we went through in the classical case. So namely, we think of homology as a functor from EN algebras in this category into sets. And we again define homology operations to be natural transformations of these homology functors. Um, and then once again, we can apply some version of the Yoneda lemma to show that operations going from the, say the product of AI KI homology with SC coefficients and landing in the BM homology with SC coefficients, such operations are in bijection with classes in the BM homology, again, of a free EN algebra, where this is free on a direct sum of SC square brackets AI KI. So that's these functors I defined over on the left that are essentially the coefficient system that shifted around a bit. So the upshot is once again, we can define operations in the same way. And if we can give a description of the homology of free EN algebras, then we will have classified all operations. Okay, so that's the setup. Are there any questions before I try to state some results? Okay, so let me say something about the E infinity case. Um, so this is the one case where I have some actual complete results. Um, so once again, I said before that the source category I will require to be symmetric monoidal, when, certainly for E infinity, in order to get a uh, symmetric monoidal functor category. Um, so one, sort of trivial consequence of this that actually turns out to be very important is the following. So if I have any, any object in the category C and I consider the braiding morphism on A. So if I have the morphism that goes from A plus A to A plus A and just swaps the factors. Um, so this is the braiding. Then since, since C is symmetric monoidal, this must satisfy that if I do the braiding twice, I get the identity, which in particular means that this, this group homomorphism phi applied to the braiding morphism and squared is equal to one. So phi of this braiding morphism therefore can only be plus or minus one. So having this condition that the source category be symmetric monoidal puts a big restriction on the coefficient systems that we can consider because we can only get this action by plus or minus one of these particular morphisms. That might seem very restrictive. In fact, this is already enough to say something about this example I mentioned earlier of special linear groups. So it still does have some applications. Um, and another comment that this is why I said I would only work with odd primes, because if plus one is equal to minus one, then these morphisms just always act trivially and that's not so interesting. Okay, so in this case, 
Um, the first thing we would like to try to do is to generalize the operations that we had from the classical case. So namely the dyer lashoff operations. That's what we had for E infinity. So here we actually obtain two different types of operations. So in the first case, if phi of this braiding morphism is equal to plus one, then I get what I call the untwisted dyer lashoff operations. So these look basically exactly like those from the classical setting. The one difference here is in the notation, I keep track of which A I started with since that's sort of relevant here. So this operation goes from the AK homology to the PA K plus two S times P minus one homology. So that's the same increase in the second degree that I had classically. And once again, I have this Bockstein version of the same operation that behaves exactly the same, except it lands in one degree lower homologically. So these behave, behave exactly like the classical operations. The other class of operations I get is when phi of this braiding morphism is equal to minus one, in which case I get what I call the twisted dyer of operations. So these actually look fairly similar. I have half integers in the exponent actually. So these go from AK homology to PA K plus two S times 2s plus 1 times p minus 1 homology. And I also have Bockstein versions of the same one that land in one degree lower. Um, OK, so this notation I use here, I've chosen this because in both cases, in homological degree, the operations raise degree by twice this index times p minus 1. The main difference is for the untwisted operations, we always get even things times p minus one. And for the twisted operations, we get odd things times p minus one. Um, okay, so I construct all of these operations and then I prove that they satisfy a bunch of relations. Um, so these are all versions of the usual relations that the classical operations satisfy. So if you're familiar with those, we satisfy things like the ADEM relations and the Carton formulas, et cetera. These relations all look very similar to so the classical ones. They just have slightly different constants. Okay. And then it turns out that these operations are enough to generate all operations. Well, these operations plus a product. So to show that, I define a free functor call it W, that goes from a, a functor category again. So here, this is the category of functors from C into graded F vector spaces. And this functor lands in a category called allowable Dyer-Lashoff algebras, which I won't define in detail. Um, so, this left-hand category is where the homology of any functor X naturally lives. So here, if X is any functor, not necessarily with a, an E infinity structure, its homology lives here. And this right-hand category is constructed precisely so that the homology of any E infinity algebra lives here. So here, y is an E infinity algebra in this functor category, and its homology lives here. So essentially, allowable dyer lashoff algebras are uh, objects in this left-hand category, but with extra structure. Namely, they have a product, and they have an action of these twisted and untwisted dyer lashoff operations. <clears throat> 
And the allowable part means they satisfy certain relations. Um, so I define this functor in terms of iterated, twisted, and untwisted Dyer-Lashoff operations together with a product. So now, if I have any x, there's always a map from x into the free E infinity algebra on x. So therefore I get a map from the homology of x into the homology of the free E infinity algebra on x. And I show that this is a free functor, so it's a left adjoint, meaning that I get an induced map from w applied to this homology of x. And the theorem then is that this map is an isomorphism of allowable Dyer-Lashoff algebras. And moreover, it's natural in maps on X. So I guess the, the sort of upshot of all of this is that this theorem then gives a description of the homology of free E infinity algebras in terms of these operations, which then proves that these twisted and untwisted Dyer-Lashoff operations together with the product generate all operations on the FV homology of E infinity algebras. So this is a complete theory for E infinity. Okay, questions about that? In the last few minutes, I wanna say a few words about the E2 case. So this is a case where I have some partial results. Um, and here the theory, like for E infinity, this theory seems sort of very similar to the classical theory. I defined these twisted versions of the classical operations and then everything worked out the same way as it did classically. For E2, things are a little bit different. The reason being that since this is the one case where I can allow my source category to be braided monoidal rather than symmetric monoidal. And therefore, this gives me a much richer class of coefficient systems because I don't have this condition anymore that these braiding morphisms have to act as plus or minus one. Sorry, suddenly my, everything seems very blurry. Hopefully you can see yeah. okay. Can I ask you a question? Maybe it will yeah. ah, clear now. Huh. <laughs> what do you mean by allowable Dyer-Lash of algebras? What's huh. the definition of it? Or what does it mean? It's, it's, there are a lot of sort of annoying formulas to write out. So I saying it explicitly is difficult. So basically, objects here are functors from C integrated vector spaces with an action of these twisted and untwisted Dyer-Lashoff operations and also a product. So they're sort of like a, a module, they have an action of the Dyer-Lashoff operations um, and they're an algebra in the sense that they have a product. Uh, the allowable part just means that there are certain relations that hold. So the classical operations, for example, are zero in certain degrees. So you have something like that here, where to be allowable, you need to require that certain operations act by zero in the appropriate degrees and things like that. Does that help? Thanks. Um, ah, the Browder bracket was, that is a very good question. Classically, the Browder bracket is only for EN algebras when N is less than infinity. So you can define a Browder, define these Browder brackets on E infinity, but they're, they're actually all zero. Um, but the Browder bracket will come up in the E2 case. In fact, that's the interesting part in the E2 case. Um, so for E2, we then again want to try to generalize all of the classical operations. So we had this product, we had these Dyer-Lashoff operations and this Browder bracket. So it turns out that uh, Dyer-Lashoff operations come from certain classes in the homology of braid groups. 
on P strands. And here, this is with twisted coefficients. And these operations have already been computed um, by a bunch of people in various settings. So there's a paper of Markarian. There's a paper of Caligaro and a paper of Ellenberg, Tran, and Westerland. So from these computational results, um, I already know sort of what possible operations I can get that might take the place of the Dyer-Lashoff operations. And it's not too difficult for me to show that you again get these certain twisted and untwisted versions of the Dyer-Lashoff operations and they beha behave sort of similarly to in the E infinity setting. Of course, there are some differences. E2 is different from E infinity. There are fewer operations, but once again, you have this behavior of these twisted and untwisted things and otherwise there's, not, there's nothing new coming here. But what is different is when we try to generalize the Browder bracket. So the Browder bracket was this binary operation. So instead of looking for binary operations, I'm going to go ahead and look for more general operations. So namely, I'll look for M area operations, where M is at least two, that look like the following. So first of all, they factor through the tensor product because that's what I had for the Browder bracket classically. So they, they take in a tensor product of M different homologies and they land in homology in degree, well, I sum up the AI degrees for the A degree. I sum up the KI degrees and then I add M minus one. So the reason I look at operations like this is that if I had a Browder bracket and I iterated it to get an M area operation, it would look like this. So this is somehow more general than the usual Browder bracket. And it turns out that such operations come from classes in the M minus one homology of the pure braid group on M strands, again with twisted coefficients. Um, okay, so I've done some computations of these homologies and I have some understanding of, of how these operations compose with one another. And so then what I've shown is that there exist situations in which you get really interesting behavior. So maybe I'll say situations arise in which there exist a bunch of these operations, specifically M minus two factorial linearly independent operations like this. So like this meaning of this form on the left. However, none of them decompose into operations on fewer inputs. Um, so this was actually quite surprising. Um, I sort of expected that either you would get a Browder bracket like normal, or it would be zero, and that would be that. But here there are cases where the Browder bracket is zero, but I have some operations that look like an iterated Browder bracket that pop up. And moreover, these operations are needed to generate all homology, sorry, to generate all operations. Um, so even in the simplest case of the free E2 algebra on a point, I can write down coefficient systems where you need one of these new operations and there's no normal Browder bracket. So understanding these seems like the, the difficult part of E2. Um, but I conjecture that these are all the operations you need, that these, these new Browder operations together with these twisted and untwisted Dyer-Lashoff operations and the product are enough to generate all E2 operations. But I'm out of time, so I'll stop there. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much, Kalista, for the great talk. Um, so, any questions uh, for Kalista? When you say functors from uh, C to graded vector spaces, you mean uh, enriched functors? Um, enriched in abelian groups? Yes. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Sure. Just curious, do you get uh, applications to homological stability for spatial linear groups? Is that is next step or do you have immediate yeah. Action? yeah so for for this this upper this uh sorry coefficient system that i described for e infinity where you basically just get this twisting by a sign that's enough to analyze this special linear groups example so um, like what kind of uh, conclusions you get out of this well okay so that's sort of upcoming work that we haven't we haven't actually worked out the actual details yet, so I I can't say anything too specific. Okay, thanks. But that's enough to analyze this thanks, example. Thanks, thanks. The, I have a second question. If you have a minute, uh, there is this uh, work by Martin Langer about the dire rush of operations on Tate cohomology of finite groups. Okay. Maybe you, uh, he was a PhD student of uh, Schweid, I think, and worked with Wolfgang Glück. And he developed, a, a, I guess, the infinity structure argument for finding dire rush of operations for Tate cohomology. And by doing so, he was able to combine the student operations also into the picture because the Tate cohomology has both uh, homology and cohomology. So are these uh, constructions you have, will have some twisted student operation thing as well, or um, is it possible to do the same here? So the answer is, I think so, but I haven't worked it out yet. Okay. So there's, there's this old paper of Peter May where he talks about how to sort of unify the dire lash of operations and the Steenrod operations. So if you consider chain complexes that are unbounded, um, then you can consider co-chains on a space as a negatively graded chain complex. And that's an E infinity algebra with the cup product structure on the co-chain level. And then the dire lash of operations there are precisely the Steenrod operations. So I think in this setting, since I am working with functors into unbounded chain complexes, um, I think that I should be able to say something about twisted Steenrod operations as well but I haven't quite worked out the details yet. I guess in the finite group case, you already have complete resolutions, which um, is used for defining Tate cohomology. So maybe uh -huh. that's a similar idea. That yeah. Yeah, for something like that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so let's thank Kalista again. Thank you very much. <laughs>